Yes, bring your own heat. Yes. Thank you for coming on this cool evening. There's only one more to go, so, so if the weather holds, we'll be all right. So this is 16th part of the History of Philosophy in 16 Questions with one more question to go, part 17, um, next Tuesday, because it turns out there was an extra Tuesday in the summer, so that's good. Um, tonight, the question I want to look at is nihilism, question mark. So picking up from where we left off, so remember... You have the Renaissance, which begins to undermine many of the assumptions that had driven Western culture for about a thousand years. You had the, uh, the Islamic Golden Age bringing in ideas and translations. You had the collapse of uh, the Greek-speaking um, Byzantine Empire, which released a lot of Greek speakers and texts. You had the arrival of the knowledge of the ancient world. You had the discovery and expansion of ideas in, in the existing world. So all these things came together, produced a renaissance in the humanist tradition. Um, and then that gets blown up, of course, in the Reformation and the Thirty Years' War, depending on how you want to score those one or multiple events. And this leads in part to the development of empiricism, which, then, as I talked about last time, becomes a scientific revolution. All of which has this tendency, as I mentioned with the scientific revolution, is it's undermining all the values that we had had up to that point, the, the notion of transcendent values. And no one is able to figure out how do you stop that continuous undermining? What, how do you uh, resist that or come up with an alternative to this? And that's been one thread, and that's why I talked about last time you had Principia Mathematica by, by Russell and Whitehead as an attempt to found knowledge in, in mathematics and, and other similar attempts, none of which have been wildly successful. And so some people have offered or argued that, well, either nihilism is the answer or nihilism is what we have. I mean, depending, but it's, this, it's the same concept, is that, well, if you don't have anything that you can absolutely believe in, then you're stuck in this world of nihilism. Um, and nihilism was given a huge push when you had the First World War. So in a way that's hard for us to imagine, a lot of the old world structure hung on from the Renaissance right up to the First World War, and it met the Enlightenment and the, the triumph of science. And there was this incredible optimism, this, uh, this sense that everything is getting better, we're making huge progress. There's all kinds of political turmoil and everything, but they always thought, this is leading someplace good, right? Technology, advancement, we're going someplace great, political ferment. And so, generally speaking, people were super excited about World War I. They're like, yes, we're gonna fight for a couple of weeks. Uh, a few people will die, that's not nice. Um, but then we're gonna have this, we're gonna, it's, it's the threshold of a new world. And that new world that's brought to us by technology and, and political revolution and new philosophies, Lockean or human, philosophies of political organization and, and material wealth, and the world is going to be great. And then just one of the most tragic bloodbaths in the history of the world, <coughs> excuse me, occurred, in which it was discovered that Technology creates mustard gas and really large artillery shells and machine guns. And all of these are not life-enhancing developments. Um, they sort of, they take a little bit of the joy out of things. And um, so this unimaginable, so really most of the central planners were planning for a war of like, you know, 12 weeks. And as it went on day after day, week after week, month after month, and just the unimaginable number of casualties. So the casualties were so high that they wouldn't report them. So none of the governments were telling their people how many people were dying because the, the, the governments were just like, if anybody finds out, we're done. Because it's just so many. It's just, it's, they're expecting casualties in the hundreds or thousands, not the tens of thousands or the hundreds of thousands. They, they, they just couldn't conceptualize. There's no planning for it, no idea that this was gonna happen. In retrospect, it looks clear. And so the, one of the aftermaths of World War I, many aftermaths, was a complete destruction of the sort of enlightenment sense of progress towards a more hopeful, beautiful, and wonderful future that was going to be delivered by technology. And all, all of a sudden, all the technologies that had looked so great, human flight, the dream of man for millennia, 
ends up being used to drop bombs and machine gun people. The train, this incredible technological revolution that moves people quickly across the landscape, was moved to massive amounts of troops to their death, right? To deliver untold quantities of ammunition to dump on the other bad people. You know, every sort of revolution that was looked at as so hopeful and glorious was met with this sort of destructive side, this dark side. And so people were just shocked. I think to a degree it's hard for us to imagine because they had such hope, there's such sense that they were in a golden age and that all this revolution and turmoil and progress was going to lead someplace magical, not someplace horrifying. And so nihilism had already been around as a concept, but it got this huge impulse. They said, right, if science is going to betray you, we know religion is crap, we know the governments are all terrible, the organ social organization leaves no place, well, then embrace nihilism. And the idea here of nihilism, as I gave it a handy definition, is the belief that all values are baseless, that nothing can be known or communicated. It is often associated with extreme pessimism and radical skepticism that contends existence. A true nihilist would believe in nothing, have no loyalties and no purpose, other than perhaps an impulse to destroy. And so, so radical skepticism, by the way, goes back to the cynics uh, in, in ancient Greece. You know? So that wasn't new. But somehow the few radical skeptics in ancient Greece tended to be quaint and their friends humored them and they thought it was hilarious. Um, it's less interesting um, when it becomes sort of almost a political movement. And so there's this extreme sense of vacuum. There, there, there's a hole where we used to believe in things. Even in Paris, even the scientific revolution that had looked so great and look, had delivered so much, lost a lot of its luster because clearly all this technology had led us someplace uh, less than good. And so people tried to respond to this. How do you fill that? We don't want to believe in nothing. We don't want to be nihilists. And so what happened is in this combat with nihilism, all of the many, many, many of the isms are born. It was sort of how do you fight nihilism with other isms? And so I just listed some of them that came into prominence at this time. Uh, one of them is structuralism. Structuralism never got a lot of play in the United States, very much a continental movement. Uh, in fact, it's the first structuralist conference in the United States, big conference, uh, which brought over a lot of thinkers from Europe here, uh, featured as one of its speakers Jacques Derrida, which is like having your first conference on Catholicism feature Martin Luther as a speaker. Right? It was like, this is, this is not, it wasn't a good introduction to the idea, it was a good introduction to the end of the idea, right? Because he's not for that system. But, but structuralism continentally was based on the idea that, oh, so if we can't find the truth in the content of things, in what it says or what it is, in the book or in the object or in the institution, maybe we can look deeper. Maybe we can borrow structures ah, from science, by the way, no, importantly, we'll borrow some systems from science and we'll look for underpinning, uh, uh, culture-spanning ideas and structures, and structuralism, that create the meaning of all of the objects and events in our world. So you don't worry so much about the objects and the events, you worry about the structures that produce the meaning that attaches to the objects and events. So the, so the general definition here, again, easy definition. The term structuralism can be applied to any analysis that emphasizes structures and relations, but it usually designates a 20th century European, especially French, school of thought that applies the methods of structural linguistics to the study of social and cultural phenomena. Starting from the insight that social and cultural phenomena are not physical objects and events, but objects and events with meaning and that their signification must therefore be focus of analysis. Structuralists reject casual, causal analysis and any attempt to explain social and cultural phenomena one by one. So that idea is like, oh, we found out that truth doesn't reside in the book. So let's look at books as a cultural phenomenon. Not the content of books, but books themselves. Right? You, you take this level. It's what science was, had been doing. Right? You don't look at, oh, each individual phenomenon. You try and look at the laws that underwrite and unify the different phenomena that you, uh, that you observe and analyze and measure and test and run experiments on. 
So when, when scientists do experiments, they aren't trying to find a conclusion to a specific question, oh, that's nice. They're trying to find a conclusion that highlights the relationships to broader things that you're studying. And so structuralists borrowed from linguistics, by the way. This is a big change. So linguistics used to be called philology. Philology just means love of languages. We love languages, the culture and literature and poetry, and that's great. And then it became linguistics because everybody wanted to be a science. And so they had to pretend like they didn't love language anymore. Now they have to study and be scientific. Uh, you know, but, but really they just love languages. Um, you know, but that's, see, that's the trick. Again, that, that empirical, the power of the empiricism really drove people to try to mimic even when probably, I mean, linguistics is not really a science, let's be clear. Um, but it's interesting, and it can be studied with great care. Um, but yeah, literature is nice too. Love languages, philology, but we gave up on that. And so the patterns from linguistics, particularly uh, French linguistic structures, was taken to apply to everything. What undergirds it? What are those laws that unify? So the truth doesn't reside in anything you can see or touch. It resides in the greater cultural and historical structures that inform them and create them and provide meaning for them. So that was an, that was an ism to say, oh yeah, all the stuff we have been looking at that had truth, we don't believe in the king anymore, but we believe in the structure that creates the meaning of kingness. Ha! People, this are not to be that popular, um, <laughs> as you might expect. It's a little abstract for most people. I mean, powerful, many insights generated this way, but uh, you know, you're sort of believing a secondhand abstract structural construction rather than what's in front of you. Not very satisfying. Um, another one, existentialism. Um, there's another ism that comes up. And existentialism has this amazing central uh, notification. It's like, um, Existence precedes essence. This is the problem as the existentialists are concerned. And this is the idea that if you pick up, famously they talked about that, like a butter knife or a spoon or a fork, uh, uh, any casual everyday object, a fork has an essence. It has a design and then you make it. So its meaning exists before the fork does. The problem with people is we have no meaning and we exist, right? We aren't designed for a purpose. And so to exist without any plan or meaning puts you in the existential crisis. Now, notice this is crazy, historically speaking, because it used to be, for almost all of human history, that A, you knew why you existed. Your culture told you what the story and meaning of your existence was, and you said yes. That's fine. I'll go with that because it's really painful and difficult to question it. It's only when you have the uh, cultural sort of conflict and developments, like in, we've talked about over several hundred years, that people are so um, distrustful and un unbelieving about their own narratives that, the, that that notion that existence becomes a problem. The other thing that cultures have said is existing is its own explanation. Right? Existence is good. You exist, great. What's the problem? But they, had, they wanted to know the meaning of existence. And they worked out that it might not have a meaning. And so you have existence with no structure to tell you what it means. And what they meant by that is the nihilist problem. Every structure that you looked at had fallen into doubt and question. Catholic Church used to tell you. Hinduism will tell you. Lutheranism will tell you. Uh, the Sufis will tell you. They, you. All these narratives that cultures used to have blown up, distrusted, nobody believes them anymore, or they become much, much less believed. And like I said, that's why last time I mentioned this notion of, of having an interfaith meeting where everybody comes together to talk about the meanings of their, this is insane. This does not help people find meaning. It says, oh, every meaning is fine, right? We're all good. We'll just all chat about it as if it's, there's no difference. So that, that, which is actually a bit of nihilism in there, right there. There's a, there's a touch of nihilism in all these interfaith. I mean, it's all good and positive and warm, but it's, it suggests that there's really nothing there. You know, that we're all just sort of in agreement, even though, of course, they're not. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a struggle. It's a, it's a challenge. Um, and so this is the concept of existentialism. And it, the problem is the existential crisis was not a crisis 
for the preceding thousands of years of cultural history. And in many societies today, it's not a crisis because you know the answer to the purpose and meaning of existence. Your culture tells you, and you go, okay. It's, it's really a peculiar situation that developed in the aftermath of a specific uh, cultural and intellectual histor historical tradition. Uh, and then Marxism, another great one. You'll see this, uh, all, you know, so many Marxist quotes. The, the first premise of all human history is, of course, the existence of living human individuals. Thus, the first fact to be established is the physical organization of these individuals and their consequent relation to the rest of nature. Now, notice this takes elements of structuralism. What are the undergirding necessary features of everything? And science. Uh, Marx always claimed he was doing science. He was not doing philosophy, he was doing science. This is the necessary laws of history. Because if you could get the necessary laws of history worked out, then you could believe in them. This is like gravity, right? This is, this, he's just saying the laws of history are like the laws of gravity. Disbelieving in gravity doesn't do anything for you. You just try to understand its meaning. You don't disbelieve it. And so uh, this is what Marx is trying to communicate for good and ill. But that was the idea. Oh, the fun fundamental thing we should look at that undergirds everything is the physical relations of people to sustaining their existence. Forget about all the other stuff. That's just sort of epiphenomena, just transient things that don't matter. The real thing that matters is this. And once you have a hold of the truth, everything follows. And so this is uh, Burley, a brilliant historian. Uh, was at Oxford. I think he left now. Um, a couple of books. But one of the things he points out is if you look at... Uh, Soviet Russia and, and Nazi Germany, they have precisely the structure of traditional religious societies. They've just replaced traditional religion with state religion. And the way they related to people and the way they carried out their warfare was the same way cultures did it in the ninth century or the fourth century or when they fought with other cultures who disagreed with them. That fundamentally, he says, they were secular religious wars between two opposing religions. Um, and I think it's, it's a very compelling argument and throws a lot of light on the fact that people wanted something to believe in. And so this filled this void that had been created. Again, this is what, uh, if, you, if you read, I referred to Dostoevsky last time, this is what Dostoevsky keeps pointing out. If you take all of this meaning from people, what do you get? You get these sick, disabled, directionless, criminal, poisoned individuals. You have to believe in something. Nihilus said, no, you don't. You can believe in nothing, which is why I like this little thing, nihilism. You know, there's nothing in there, and I believe in it, right? So it's the, it's the belief that you shouldn't believe in anything, right, which is sort of a problem. You see the problem there? It's a, it's a, tricky, it's a tricky little problem. But, but that notion is, is this necessary? Is this all we're left with? And so after all these isms have rolled out, which you know, is sort of the history of 20th century political and philosophical thought, and we're not out of this, by the way. We're not done. Um, when people talk about, oh, um, factfulness or fact-based ideas or fake news or all of these terms that you hear, what people are trying to say is, hey, we don't have a fundamental agreement on the nature of reality. This is a strange place for cultures to be. Historically, this happens. But, but it is, a, generally speaking, people agree about what they're arguing about. We're in this state where we don't agree on what we're arguing about, which makes it incredibly difficult to communicate um, with people in on, on, on all kinds of different manners. And so it ha even people who don't believe in nihilism are struggling in this sort of nihilistic environment because, again, as I mentioned last time, even if we believe in things, we tend to know or feel the counter-arguments to them, or we see examples of the counter-arguments. And we go, oh, well, you know, maybe I don't want to push that too hard, because I know that there's, you know, right? We have, it, we're almost like self-critics, all these arguments in our head going on. And when you read classic literature, this is always the beauty of it. When you read uh, from any classical period, by the way, cl classical Chinese literature, classical uh, Persian literature, classical Indian literature, classical um, you know, Greek or Roman literature, there's this organizing sense that I know who I'm talking to, 
I know what they know, and we're communicating. And so I can be very direct and very strong. It, it's, it's, if you read like uh, even the French comedic geniuses uh, of, of French classical uh, you know, theater, you just realize their culture, they all knew what they were talking about. They might disagree about things, but they knew what they were talking about. And we're not there in, at, at all, right? Everybody's clear on this? That, that this is not where we are. So we don't have that organizing principle. So bizarrely, we're sort of all carry, even if we aren't nihilists and we disbelieve or disagree with nihilism, we do carry this little bubble of nihilism with us. It's sort of a gift of our culture to us, is that this you know, core of struggle to find an ism or something that allows you to construct meaning so that then you can make decisions and think about the world and understand what's coming at you. Because now here's the core of this. What you lose when you lose the philosophical, uh, theological, political grounding is not the world. The world doesn't change. You, you lose, and this is what the structuralists are so right about, you lose the meaning of the world. Things happen, but you have a hard time figuring out what they mean because you don't have a clear set of references that people generally agree on to, to say, oh, this is, this is what this means. Uh, an example now is we have, everybody knows we have these huge disparities of wealth. And so it's just a trivial example, but it, it, I think it's functional here. And so people will say something like, well, that is expensive. So now expensive has no meaning anymore. Because in a world where, um, you know, I think it's 15% of the population lives on a dollar a day or $2 a day. Um, by the way, which by historical standards is unbelievably wealthy. Right, so, so poverty is better than it's ever been. It's, it's amazingly good. Not, we're not done, but understand that's huge progress. But if you're making $2 a day, roughly speaking, $5 is unimaginably expensive. $10 is, you know, $1,000 is a million, right? But it, if, if you have a billion and a half, $2 billion in liquid assets, what's expensive? Right? People go to these art auctions, and you always hear in the news, like, oh, painting sold for $100 million. And people go, oh my god, that's so much money. But they're interviewing this one guy who, you know, who manages these sorts of purchases, and he says, oh, I tell all my clients that you should never spend more than 5% of your income per year on any single purchase. Which is reasonable. Right? That's a perfectly reasonable metric to say, well, I wouldn't spend more than 5% of my money on like art, so that makes sense. It's just that 5% for some people is $100 million. So is it expensive or is it cheap? Right, you see, so we, so like metrics make no sense anymore, like what? You, or you read all the time, oh, somebody bought a million dollar property, oh my God, that's so expensive, tore down the house, bought the property next to it, tore down that house, and built something that cost 10 times as much as what was there. So something that most people looked at as expensive, almost everybody totally out of their reach, somebody else looked at it and said, oh, let's tear that down, and buy the next place and tear that down, and built something nice, decent, something you could live in. <laughs> right, you see, it's just like, wah -huh? But, and, we're, and we see it, so this is the other thing. We all, we all see this at the same time. Um, and so these disparities are bizarre, and it throws us off, because it makes it hard for us to understand what, what things mean. Uh, a final example on this is because you know, money and price is so fascinating. Um, if you want to buy a nice Ferrari, you have to apply. People always talk about how expensive Ferraris are. They aren't expensive. They're so cheap that they will not sell them to anybody. They have far more demand than they have production. So you have to apply to buy a Ferrari. Generally speaking, if you aren't famous for some reason that they like, they will not let you buy a Ferrari. They will allow you to buy a used Ferrari, and then you drive that for a while, and if they still like you, maybe they'll let consider selling you a newer used Ferrari, and then eventually you'll work your way up to an actual new Ferrari. And so they go, oh, this is a million dollar car, or whatever, $700,000, $2 million. You know, how many people could be trying to buy it? Well, so many people that they actually create artificial scarcity and force you to apply 
to buy a multi-million dollar vehicle. See how crazy that is? It's weird, right? That's, that's, a, that's, that's like, ha, what? And so at every level, we run into these like staggering environments that we don't really know because we have no agreed on metric. And that's just value, you know, talk, uh, uh, or in a world of seven plus billion people, we have a hard time getting our, our, our minds around anything related to the numbers involved in just people being alive, right? We go, oh, well, how much milk do people drink a day? The number is, you know, is billions of pounds of milk. It's an it's, it's astronomical, astronomical number. We can't associate like one gallon of milk times a billion. No, I can't think that. Right, it's just unthinkable. So even the day-to-day -day systems that we live in baffle us. Because again, we don't have any clear, agreed-on metric. And then when you get to more, you know, sort of cultural abstract things, was this a good movie? Is this politician valuable? Is that a reasonable law? Should people behave that way? Well, now it's just totally out the window. Because that stuff, I mean, if we can't figure out what price should be of something, we have, that, we have no chance. Right, clearly so many cultural values are under change and, and under tension. And again, now we have access to the whole world. So we don't have our cultural traditions and we don't have the cultural traditions of people that live around us. We have the cultural traditions of everybody who's ever lived on the planet, which is both unbelievably great. It's one of the most wonderful things and totally disorienting. When I was talking to somebody and she said that she thinks of it as like, before, we were all on these isolated islands, and our cultures developed their biosystems and their flora and fauna in isolation, and then continental drift sort of crammed them all together. And so it's like, you know, all of a sudden, an, an island that never had predators gets tigers on it, right? And so all that cute little fuzzy bunnies are gone. Because they're like, ooh, look, a tiger. <laughs> Right, and then you know, so it's like all of these plants and animals and flora and fauna and insects are all suddenly find themselves face to face, and weird stuff is happening because they've never been face to face before. It's it's hard to figure out precisely how how to, to take this. I I'm, I'm a big follower of Indian politics, um, and if you ever want to see something incorrectly reported, watch. It, it almost never happens, by the way. American news never talks about the rest of the world. Uh, occasionally they do, and it's wrong. Um, but it, it, you know, they, they can't figure out what's going on with Indian politics, because it's a huge country with this incredibly rich cultural tradition. All these regions that are very and much more independent than most American states. This is one thing to understand. Indi Indian states are like vastly more independent. Than, and the political system doesn't work anything like our system. You know, it just, it's just different. But they always try to use our metrics. And they go, it's the largest democracy on earth. It is the largest democracy on earth. And it's weird to us. I watched a German news report on the American presidential election system with the Electoral College. And they were just, they, they could not figure it out. And they're just like trying to like, and they're like, wait, wait, no, really, this is how, or people are like, no, like, yeah, it's, no, it's, a, it's hilarious. Right, because, and by the way, the German system is untrackable. You know, they have this proportional state system and like, who knows what's going on? So even when there's something that's like, oh, democracy, they're a democracy, we don't even know what that means. Even, you know, because there's always the democracies that aren't trying to be democracies. Uh, but the ones that are doing, you know, democratic things, they're not doing it the way we do it. And so we, we're like, wow, how do I find meaning in this? The answer is probably hard. Um, and, and, and as long as you compare it to yourself, when you're inundated with this entire world, and uh, probably, probably not that helpful. And we know this. We go, oh, that wasn't very good. I didn't, that didn't work. I need to rethink that. But you can only rethink so much. And when you're inundated with input from all kinds of sources that don't agree with you, and you don't have any core, really strong core, because you have this little box of nihilism in your mind, Wow, it gets tough. And again, hence the popularity of isms. Hence the desire to look for a radically simplifying something that allows me to go, you know, uh, I don't know, whatever, nationalism, yay. Uh, you know, uh, whatever, socialism must be socialist, yay. You know, whatever. It doesn't matter what, the, what, what it is, it's just this, this deep desire to say, I need a simplifying rubric 
So I can hold almost everything up to it and go, does this measure good, bad, indifferent? Yes, no, great. And I need one that many people I'm with agree on. Because otherwise then you're just isolated. And we know that's bad. And so, again, to return here, so even if you're not like a card-carrying nihilist, whatever that would be, by the way, uh, uh, even if you're not really like going, oh, you know, we're just doomed, there's no meaning, there's no order, there's it's all... You know, there's no sense of values. It's all just burn it down. It doesn't matter. We're all going to die in the big explosion of the sun at some point anyway, so forget it, right? Even if you're not on that camp, which very few people are, even people who tried to do that, it turns out to be difficult to sustain. Uh, you know, it's kind of depressing, uh, if nothing else. Um, but we do have a little bit of nihilism in us. Um, because again, we're exposed to all of this and it creates intellectual dissonance and this sort of opens up that space. But I want to suggest that space is not all bad. Um, it tends to be very bad and it's been very negative. You don't want too much of it. But notice it's also the space of questioning. It's the space that allows you to open up and say, okay, maybe we do have something to learn from Sri Lanka. What are they doing over there that, that, that we might be able to import? that we might be able to look at and go, hey, maybe that's a better way. Maybe they're doing something good. Or uh, uh, to, to re-examine one's own values. Say, oh, maybe I'm doing something that is, uh, now I, I think, kind of dubious. But by the way, this is the Me Too movement, which I think is fascinating in many ways, uh, not the least of which is because the culturally accepted norms of behavior, not legal, but culturally accepted norms of behavior has shifted. And now we have this lag between the way people were behaving and the way we expect them to behave now. And it's created this huge amount of tension because there's like this historical backlog of bad behavior, right? In theory, we all now agree you're not supposed to abuse women at work. This was not agreed on before. That generally was agreed that it was fine to abuse women at work, right? I and mean, that was just sort of culturally accepted as, I mean, it's horrifying, don't get me wrong, but it just was. Like, oh, you just had to put up with it. If you didn't put up with it, well, you're a crybaby woman, you know, it's a man's world, you gotta toughen up and take the abuse, right? That was, that was roughly the cultural narrative. And now we're like going, nah, let's rethink that. Maybe we ought not abuse women at work, just saying, just, just <laughs> posit that as a possibility. Maybe run the experiment. But what it's done is it created this historical lag. So people who were behaving 20 years ago and 10 years ago in a certain way finally suddenly find their behavior unacceptable, which throws them off completely. Because culture had been telling them, you're fine. You're okay. You're a criminal. That's a big switch. You can reverse this for marijuana, by the way. You're a criminal, and eh, it's been you know, uh, decriminalized, which means we're probably not gonna prosecute you, but it's not necessarily legal. Two, it's legal. Same behavior. Behavior not changing. Social understanding and response to the behavior, totally 100% different. So this is, this is baffling to us. But to, to reassess our values, to reorganize them, requires us to have a little bit, just a little bit of the nihilist box. So we can open up some doubt, so we can open up some questioning, at least temporarily, and go, oh, maybe on one, we shouldn't abuse women at work, and two, it might be okay to smoke marijuana and not put people in jail for forever. And also think about this now that this is, um, now, in the, in the country, there are states where it's totally legal. You can ask a police officer to light your joint for you. Fine. <laughs> and there are states where possession of any quantity is a felony that will land you in jail for decades. Same country. And, and the feds, yes, feds totally baffled. Like, what do we do about that? Right? And so, wow. Which values? Which values do we go with? Right? And the only way to really do this is to open up that space and go, huh, I, I need to rethink. Maybe I'll rethink and go, no, I, I was okay. 
what I was doing before, I'm, I'm okay with it, I understand it, I see that the context has changed, but, or I go, yeah, no, I think I need to change, kind of sort of adjust my, my values and adjust perhaps my behaviors and start, you know, sort of like, oh, recon reconsidering this. And that, and that requires that, that box of nihilism. And again, it's hard for us to see this because if you go back in history, these people didn't go door to door and say, hey, would you like to be a Muslim? Have a, have a little piece of literature <laughs> about the Quran. I think you'll find Muhammad a very fascinating, important person. Give us a call. Yeah, this is not how you, you didn't say, you, have, you know, rethink, no, convert or die, toe the line or die. And even when you had the cosmopolitan areas where you had different religions living together, generally speaking, the rule was your religious community was ruled by your religious laws and your religious leaders were in charge. And if you broke the law, they suffered. So they had to keep you in line and you could convert to the dominant religion so if you were in Toledo during the golden age of Islam, you could become a Muslim, and many people did, because it seemed like the obvious thing to do. They're winning. Hey, they've got it going on. Uh, but if you were a Muslim and you converted to Catholicism or Judaism, they killed you. Capital offense. Right? So a little questioning one way is okay. A questioning the other way, not okay. So, so history has not really been a big promoter of rethinking things of opening that little box of doubt and skepticism in your mind. Uh, another thing we take for granted that we've lost track of is the freedom of movement. Um, throughout most of human history, throughout most of the world, if you left where you lived without written permission of some sort, um, that was either punishable by death or they would simply imprison you and take you back to your community and say, why is this person out wandering around? And this is when people say, oh, they were exiled. Generally, being exiled meant you were going to die. Because once you left the protection of whatever culture or society or area you were in, city, um, you were fair game. It was legal for criminals to assault you, kill you, and take your stuff. That was fine. Because you, weren't, you, you no longer had personhood because you've left your commune or your village or your city or whatever. That was pretty much standard. Um, and so the sense of, oh, I want to rethink where I live. Uh, no. No. You don't want to rethink where you live because that will get you killed. Traveling was rare, bizarre even, dangerous, but you had to have special permission. Because if you didn't have the permission, you were basically potentially going to die. And so that even, even something as simple as that, you did not rethink, you did not like ponder and go, oh, do I want to live in the Pacific Northwest, sort of rainy in the winter, a little cold. I think I'd rather go someplace warm and sunny like Arizona. Imagine if you went to Arizona and you landed at the airport and now you're just totally free green. They can just kill you and take all your stuff. See, less people would go to Arizona. <laughs> it would, it just, you wouldn't snowbird, right? That wouldn't be a thing. Because it'd just be, you know, it's not going to be functional. So you wouldn't even think about it. You wouldn't open it up as a possibility in your mind. And so um, we're in this strange situation where, on one hand, too much nihilism is clearly self-defeating uh, and, and a problem. And there is this nihilistic strains that do crop up in various aspects um, that create all kinds of, of philosophical, intellectual, cultural difficulties. This is sort of the just burn everything to the ground concept and start over. This is a nihilistic concept. Um, but too much certainty in a world in which we're inundated with so many possibilities is also a problem. Right? And we, we tend to want to answer nihilism with a solution. This is Dostoevsky's idea, Russian Orthodox Christianity, a crazy version of it, Dostoevsky's version of it, but nonetheless. Uh, uh, um, who's, who, who wrote this over the, the great? Uh, Kazantzakis, Nikos Kazantzakis, the brilliant Greek author. He was a Greek Orthodox Christian. Dostoevsky and, 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 and Nikos Kazantzakis are basically brothers. I mean, they, they, they stem from the same, you know, incredibly uh, powerful embrace of this Orthodox uh, version of Christianity that gives the power to their writing that people find so attractive. But we also know that leads to crazy fundamentalism, which has its own problems. 
things, right? And so our real trick is not necessarily to try and find a true, capital T, truth, but to try to find some way to maintain a little bit of nihilism um, in the midst of a world that's constantly bombarding us with more than we can deal with. It's a, it's a real, like I said, this is an actual truth. You probably felt this. I mean, if you haven't felt this, I would be surprised. You're like, I just don't know how to process all this. I don't know what all this means. I don't know. This is too new, too different, too strange. Like I said, if you were born um, a while ago, say post-war, you lived through homosexuality is a criminal psychological derangement for which you can go to jail, and in any case, it doesn't exist because no one ever mentioned it. Right? To gay marriage. That's a unimagined, like that's a vast cultural like, transition in the landscape. I mean, that's huge on, on so many different levels. And so on one hand, I'm never sure why anybody cares. On the other hand, I go, man, if you were raised that way, Sure, that's, a, that's like a titanic just overthrow of all kinds of fundamental things you probably believed about the world. It's a psychological dissonance. And, and again, just uh, culturally, I'm trying to think of uh, other examples. There's so many, oh, uh, just the technology infiltrating everything. Right? But before, I mean, just technology just wasn't around all that much. Computers used to be in offices someplace. People did things on them, nobody knew what. And then the whole home computer became a thing. That was an idea. People thought that'll never catch on. IBM thought that, by the way. They were wrong. Um, it cost them many billions of years, uh, dollars and many years of lost revenue because they thought, well, no one's going to want these at home. Turns out people do want them at home. And now the computer industry is in trouble because people are like, yeah, computers, done with that. Now we have you know, video games and cell phones and we have all this other technology. So much more fun. And then you know, pretty soon maybe that'll go out the window. Who knows? People are working on it. Let's replace it with something new. Meanwhile, we're still just regular human beings who were raised in one technological environment that just seems to change every five years. Nothing to do with us. We just have to adapt to it. I got in a new car the other day. My car is very old, um, runs-ish. Uh, and, and it doesn't have like computer screens in it. And so I got in a car that had like this huge computer screen. It freaked me out. I'm like, what the hell is that? You can't drive with a TV. <laughs> That seems dangerous. And it was big. I mean, it wasn't like a little, it was big. I was like, what is going on? And they said, where have you been? I'm like, the 1987 Toyota. Uh, you know, uh, and that's where I've been. Uh, but that, that just, you know, that is just like, so things have changed since 1987, I can tell you this. Uh, wow. Wow. So I, I mean, I was just, I guess I had no idea how, what any of this was, how it worked, why it was there. But it's there now. If you go and buy a car, I imagine you're stuck with this stuff. I mean, you can't say, I want something where I can roll down the windows manually and has no computer screens. I don't, I, is that an, probably not an option anymore. <laughs> right? And then pretty soon they'll have self-driving cars. Um, they, they're coming that you can take out on the roads and all that, and then that'll be a revolution. When your cars drive themselves, probably a good idea, because hopefully the computers will crash less than the humans. Um, but we'll see. Who knows? But again, no one's asking you. They're not taking a poll how many of you would like self-driving cars. They're just going to develop them, and if people buy them, there you go. That's all that matters. And so uh, in, in so many ways, all these technological, social, political, intellectual revolutions are pressing in on us. And, and we don't really know how to deal with it. Um, and so that's, that's where we are. We've entered the age of nihilism. We all have to be at least a little bit nihilistic, probably. We don't want to be too much nihilistic, but we don't know how the hell to get out of it. And that's going to be lecture 17, by the way, <laughs> in this 16-part series. Uh, so next time, I'm going to suggest possibly some things that are developing to suggest how we might be leaving this era of, of nihilism, either big or small, however you think of it. Because one of the things that's clear from cultural history um, is they go through periods of classicism, which is when people agree on what they're arguing about, and then periods of what Barzan calls decadence, which is where we are, where you don't agree with what you're arguing about. But those periods always lead to either total social collapse, which happens, or your society goes on and it comes to a new agreement. And once you have that new agreement, you're in a new classical age. And people go, oh, now we agree again on what we're arguing about. And it's very comfort comforting, particularly at first. 
So nihilism this time, potential futures next time. Thank you very much.